I suppose in, this is the point in this discussion uh, to point out that there, this visible language that I'm talking about, there is a precedent for it in nature. Uh, there's a very interesting book, which if you're into animal communication, it's well worth reading. It's called uh, Communication and Non-Communication uh, Among the Cephalopods. And it points out that octopi uh, have this ability to change their color and their shape and their surface texture. And it was at first assumed that this had to do with camouflage against complex backgrounds. But it turns out that it has nothing to do with that or very little to do with that, that octopi communicate visually and so, in a sense, the octopus is the model for the kind of future evolution of human communications that I'm suggesting we need. The octopus is, from the point of view of another octopus, uh, a naked mind, an entirely naked mind, because it does not <coughs> transduce its thoughts into acoustical waves which move across space and are then reconstructed in a culturally sanctioned dictionary, it actually becomes its meaning. It translates syntax into three dimensions, and it dances its intent. And the soft body of these creatures allows them to fold and unfold and reveal and hide parts of themselves very rapidly. As fast as we can make speech, they do this. And so th this is a potential model for how human beings might communicate. After all, if we were simply naked minds, I imagine us as existing as somewhat filamentaceous creatures in a semi-aqueous cybernetic medium with us displaying our syntactical uh, intent on our surface. You would become what you mean in that case. And the octopus does that. The reason octopi extrude ink into the water is so that they can form a private thought. It's the only way that they're able to disconnect from the telepathic net. Well, the question is, what about the way ayahuasca is being done in America without ikaros and ritual? I've never sat in on an American ayahuasca session. I know they occur in several different styles. The thing about ayahuasca that you have to be aware of that is both a strength and a weakness of it is that unlike mushrooms or peyote or iboga or morning glory seeds or datura, it is a drug in the sense that it's combined of two ingredients and made by somebody. Nobody makes peyote. Nobody makes mushrooms. But somebody makes ayahuasca. And, and it's like uh, flan or something. It can be made badly or it can be made well. So the first issue is how was it made? And the style of these more public ayahuasca circles is to make it mild. They don't want people swinging from the chandeliers. It, ayahuasca can range over a spectrum from what's all the excitement about to, you know, hang on Hannah. <laughs> the, and, and so, you know, it takes a bit of fiddling uh, uh, to get it right. As far as DMT is concerned... Uh, Ayahuasca is driven by DMT. What made me go to the Amazon was I first encountered DMT in the underground in Berkeley in 1967. And I was absolutely amazed. I mean, I had already taken LSD, and, and, but for me and to this moment, uh, DMT is just the most amazing thing in the universe. I mean, it shouldn't exist. 
it, it's impossible. And every time I do it, I come down and I say, this is impossible. Possible. I mean, to call that a drug? What a joke. I mean, it just masquerades as a drug. It's not a drug. That's preposterous. Uh, the problem with DMT is its incredible power. That only the most intrepid can form any coherent impression whatsoever of what's going on if it's a strong trip. I mean, there are sub-threshold trips where you just graze the tummy of the beast and then people come down with various models of archetypal closure with the cosmic carnival. That's the archetype of DMT, is the cosmic circus. And, and, but once you, if you actually get a strong hit of it, which is in no way dangerous, but simply a true boundary dissolving hit, it's into some place, it's almost like, well, I once said, you know, the, there's danger of death by astonishment. <laughs> and, and I think that's true. That's the major danger is death by astonishment. Because you just get in there and you say, my God, you know, I thought I had some expectation of what was possible. And instead, this is just so blown that. And it, re- it somewhat freaks me out, I have to confess. It's, it is so alien, so huge, so complete in itself, so unrelated to our petty concerns on this planet. I mean, I went to it first as an art historian, and, the, and I was a Jungian. I mean, I, you know, I had Jungian proclivities. And, and I thought, you know, w- what does this say about the archetypes? There is no archetype for this. Not in the painting of the Bushman, not in the ecstasies of Hildegard von Bingen, not in the ravings of Mandayan ecstatics. Human spiritual experience never got this deep, never tore open this doorway. And yet what? It's a long toke away for an ordinary human being? How could something that (laughs) titanic and beautiful and cosmic and alien be kept secret when what we do is we seek in all corners, in all times and places for the bizarre, the outre, the unthinkable. We're always turning over rocks, secret teachings, you know, ancient cities, buried ruins, lost tribes, you name it. (laughs) Well then, here is this thing which is like the absolute quintessence of what all those things are, are aiming for. You know, more stunning than the rise of Atlantis from the Atlantic seaboard is a toke of the MT, more appalling than the, arise, the arrival of alien star fleets in the skies of our planet. And yet, it's here. It's here. And I don't often invoke it. I mean, for me to talk about it is to invoke it because it's weird to talk about it because it reminds me that we don't know what we're doing at all, that we sit in rooms discussing all this stuff and, and, you know, a war rages, ignorant armies clash by night, that whole thing. But, you know, this extraordinarily powerful thing, the depth of which, the measure of which is so hard to take, lies very near. What I had hoped from, what I had hoped for from ayahuasca was... Uh, my brother and I, when we got into this DMT stuff, we said, we've got to slow down this movie. I mean, you get in there for about 70 seconds, the first 35 of which is taken up with you checking all your meters to make sure you're not dead. <laughs> because that's that's what you assume. You know, you, ass- you say, I did it, I'm dead, I'm, fuck it, I'm dead. <laughs> and And then you say, but you know, chest rising and falling, (laughs) thoughts continuing in linear... Apparently, I'm not dead. (laughs) Apparently, I'm something else. Well, then, by the time you sort it out, you're usually coming down. And people come down babbling, raving. I mean, I've seen, you know, people who've headed mega corporations, people who are accustomed to uh, ordering hundreds of people around, just completely... uh, come apart because it is so unexpected, 
So our notion was slow the movie down, get in there. And uh, uh, ayahuasca looks like a strategy for doing that. And we couldn't imagine, you know, can you picture people wearing penis sheaths and painting themselves with red ochre and they have this and this is what they're doing? And, and then it makes the whole notion of history seem crazy. I mean, I mean, we're primitives because we way diddle around with atom smashers and stealth bombers and stuff like that. I mean, you know, and these people have this other thing. So, of course, they don't wear clothes. Build up. Would you? You know? And uh, largely, I would say, uh, what we've learned from 20, 25 years of dealing with this is that our strategy was right. Ayahuasca will let you in to these places, and so will psilocybin. What I've decided, based on experience, is that uh, what I'm interested in is a very tiny subset of all the smorgasbord of possible altered states and experiences that life and nature offer up, that there are many altered states, Datura, ketamine, MDMA, uh, endlessly, and then, you know, uh, states brought on by ordeal and, uh, and fasting and meditation. I, I am only interested as a phenomenologist, definitely more with the attitude of the scientist than some kind of conclusion drawer. I'm interested in this very circumscribed area in organic nature because it's not supposed to be there, folks. It's like a, a little a, a doorway into the previous universe or something. The whole, you know, in the in at the height of Islam in the 10th century, the poets of the Mughal dynasty said of the city of Isfahan in in Iran because of its mosques and architecture that it was half the world. The Isfahan is half the world. DMT is half the world. The shiny, bright active, uh, exfoliating and bizarre part. Well then, we then are poised in this strange dimension of diminished possibility. Where are we? What is that? What is it to possess a body such that you can use it as an instrument to turn on and off these places? How does it reflect on the quest for understanding of the here and now? How does it request, uh, reflect on the quest for, uh, uh, I don't know, immortality or, or enlightenment or uh, a, a sense of fitting in to the cosmic purpose? Um, I don't know. I mean, one can play a reductionist game and say that the human brain-mind system is an alarm clock, DMT is a hammer, hit the alarm clock with the hammer and you learn all about gears <laughs> because they spring out and become visible. But uh, And this is how science works. This is the scientific method. Smash it. Then count the pieces. Find the bigger pieces. Find the littlest pieces. Smash them. Count the pieces. Find the little pieces. Smash them. That's how it proceeds. Well, obviously, that's not going to take us too far in this domain because it's entirely made up of structure, of connection, of relationship, of uh, thought. And uh, because I'm concerned about the planet and the predicament we're in and the way we spend our resources and cheat our children of a sane future and all that, I keep trying to reconnect this back into the human world. But I frankly don't know whether that can be done. Another area I work in is I try to connect it up to the perennial philosophies of, of humanity, Zen and Buddhism and shaman. I don't know whether that can be done. The shamans that I have gotten really close to have not been, I would not call, they were able to cure people, but they had no pretension of spiritual accomplishment. They weren't even interested in that. They were interested in what they would call understanding. 
the same thing which drives a scientist. They say, I, I mean, Don Fidel, who I took most of my ayahuasca with, we would take it on Saturday nights with a group of about 40 people and cure and then we would take it on Wednesday nights, just he and I or a couple of other people. And that was for learning. He always said, and he said, you can't cure unless you learn. And I felt very comfortable with these people because it, it from the outside, it looks like ritual and taboo and power. And from the inside, it's just, hey, let's all cook something up and try to figure it out. It was totally familiar to me from my days in Berkeley in the 60s. It's the head ethic. It's cook it up, try it out, try and make sense of it with your friends. And uh, if we... You see, I think it's very disempowering to believe that somebody else has the answer and that your life consists of sorting out a bunch of options to try and find this person who has the answer. Uh, The generous point of view, the ecumenical point of view, when looking at the world's religions and spiritual traditions, is to say everybody has a piece of the answer. You know, the Buddhists have a piece, the Kabbalists have a piece, everybody has a piece. The mushroom on this subject is extremely ungenerous. It says, nobody has a peace. It's just preposterous. You know, the reason the world doesn't make sense to you is because the world doesn't make sense to you. How could it? I mean, look where you're starting from. Where is it writ in adamantine that troops of monkeys should comprehend the architectonics of the cosmos? You know, it's just uh, not part of the deal. So uh, then you have to rest with some kind of a, a provisional arrangement. But I, I somehow think that the forced evolution of language is how we're going to work our way back into taking care of our planet and that psychedelics are the catalyst for this. They show us, number one, that there is a transcendent other which I certainly didn't believe there was till I took psychedelics. I mean, I was raised Roman Catholic. I spent a lot of time deconditioning myself from the transcendent other and embracing a kind of, uh, of materialist agnosticism. Well, that lasted 15 seconds into the first DMT trip, and then that had been vaporized <laughs> for all time. So I, I think we need to honor the religious impulse, but I'm very, I'm very skeptical of all hierarchical con games where the idea is somebody knows something and somebody else doesn't, and then they have to trade off their uh, relationship. You know, the Rolling Stones have a song that says, you don't get what you want, you get what you need. Uh, I don't think you're going to spend very long involved with these things at a deep level without scaring your socks off uh, eventually. I mean, one of the great things about these psychedelic teachers is that they are so gentle with beginners and then the flip side of that coin is they are so unforgiving with veterans and uh, I don't know I mean I have hard trips often and the way I explain it to myself is you know I pretty much accept Rupert Sheldrake's notion of the morphogenetic field and uh Uh, feel like the psychedelics amplify the morphogenetic field of the totality and you know why shouldn't I have difficult trips the totality is in such a weird state of turmoil I mean you couldn't pay me to take five grams of mushrooms in the present circumstances simply because I can feel the riptides in the historical dimension just churning everything into white water I mean, I'd stay out of the water till uh, it dies down a little. Uh, Fear is a problem because, well, there are different reasons, but here's a a reductionist reason. These compounds are CNS stimulants, and that means they're going to stimulate what's called the fight-or-flight 
reflex in the hind brain. One of the hardest things I think you, you have to learn to do is to discipline the hind brain. You know, to sit in a full lotus position, absolutely petrified with fear, and not do anything about it, except breathe and sing. You know, um, Paul Herb, uh, Paul Herbert, <laughs> the other Herbert, the Herbert who wrote Dune who is such a minor figure that I can't even remember his first name, Frank Herbert, he uh, has a wonderful thing in there talking about fear. And he says, fear comes like a wind out of the desert and it blows through you. And all you can do is let it blow itself out. And you really can do this. You just wait. Fear is a kind of state of... Uh, agitation of the organism that chemically cannot maintain itself very long. So wait it through. Then in terms of practical suggestions, sing. You must sing. I mean, it's terrible to be have it sit heavily on you and to try and deal with it like this, you know, just crumple. You have to oxygenate your body. You have to begin moving energy through your body. You can sing your way out of most situations. That's the best advice. And you can breathe your way out of, of most situations. And uh, it's a set of techniques. No, you're quite right. It's a set of techniques. They're very simple, but if you don't know them, you're in deep, deep water. And breath control... And not being afraid to articulate. We have some kind of taboo against sounding. But, you know, I've sung, I've started in the depths of hell singing to save my soul and managed to sing my way right through normality and right on into heaven, you know. It takes courage. And courage is not something that is demanded of us very much in the modern world. I mean, we occasionally deal with large amounts of fear, like when some jackass cuts in front of you in, on the freeway and, you know, you soak your clothes with sweat in under a third of a second, those kinds of things. But courage, where we actually determine to do something that feels dangerous or challenging to us, and then doing it, we don't do. And especially boundary-dissolving challenges... I mean, the macho type will, you know, climb El Capitan, jump out of airplanes, uh, and, uh, and that sort of thing. But strangely enough, those macho types are sometimes the most reluctant to just sit quietly in their living room on five dried grams because uh, it's a different kind of surrender. You know, it's a it's a surrender to something feminine and penetrating, and uh, you don't have to. It's the opposite reflex. Surrender is the opposite reflex to conquest. Did you want to say something? No. Yeah. Could you contrast uh, this experience uh, with the experience like the trance dance or the bushman or Kundalini type of experiences? Well, it's very hard to get inside somebody else's experience, especially when it's culture-bound. For purposes of operational efficiency, I just have long ago decided nothing works but drugs. <laughs> and, and it causes a lot of friction. I mean, that's the hard way of putting it. It's really nothing works but plants. But... Uh, I put in a lot of time trying, you know, breath control and pranayama and all these things and reading the literature. And I just, I'm just not convinced that they're getting it. The literature doesn't reflect it. The, the mystical literature in all times and places tends toward unitary, um, effulgence or something, the white light. In other words, everything is supposed to be, all contradictions are dissolved, everything becomes love and light and the hierophany, 
this is the archetypal hierophany. Uh, I don't, this is not what they're talking about in the Amazon. They enter into a world of jeweled multiplicity. There is no effort to push it towards some kind of neoplatonic uh, end state. It's that what is revealed is a dimension of incredible complexity. And some people have said of me, to me, uh, that I'm lost in samsara. I can accept that. That sounds right. Uh, I love multiplicity. I mean, I'm, I love nature, which to me means multiplicity. I'm an insect collector, for God's sake, an art historian, a, a heresy hunter. It's for me all in the details. That's what I love, the richness, the texture of it. And uh, I... It's a troubling question for people because people want to be told that there's another way to get to it. And there may be, but it's unbelievably difficult, unbelievably uncertain, and uh, uh, very hard to recognize. Schizophrenia, it doesn't convince me entirely that that's the same thing. Many schizophrenics are obviously very, very unhappy people. And uh, you see, I just don't feel the force of this argument that you should be able to do it on your own. Why should you be able to do it on your own? How about that you can't do it unless you humble yourself to cut a deal with a plant? That seems more logical to me, you know, that it begins with an act of humility instead of an act of, you know, no women, no dope, no this, I'm going to seal myself into the alchemical vessel. Yeah. Are, are you, is that statement reflecting a, a, a position that there's a potentiation in the pharmacokinetics? I mean, are you, are you or is this really based upon the activity of chemicals and the interaction of chemicals in the brain. And then to go along with that, in your, in your own pushing to try to understand this, how do you value the philosophical versus the actual, again, that model of, well, can we talk about any cerebral cortical uptake or uh, biochemistry again? How do you value those two? Well, I'm not. I'm not sure. I. I'm not sure I understand your question. I mean, I'm very interested in the nuts and bolts details of how this happens. And my brother is a, a pharmaceutical chemist, drug designer. So we work in the in, on the nuts and bolts issue. Uh, I want to know where these visions are coming from. I would like a complete understanding of the psychedelic experience. I would like to turn the light of the psychedelic experience upon the psychedelic experience and and try to understand uh, what's happening. The best theory so far, I think my brother and I put together in a book we wrote called The Invisible Landscape, uh, there are certain clues. Obviously, uh, memories persist in human beings throughout a lifetime. But we know that no physical part of the organism persists through a lifetime except the neural DNA. That means that we either have to hypothesize that memories are copied perfectly and handed along in some system uh, so that you can have them even though every atom in your body has changed except the neural DNA. Or we have to hypothesize that they exist in the neural DNA, that memories are actually stored in the DNA. Well, no notion invokes, evokes such scorn from molecular biologists as this one, and they just rush in to set you straight in a hurry. And the first thing they tell you is, well... <laughs> You've completely misunderstood the notion of information. You see, DNA stores genetic information. It stores codons. It stores these three amino acid sequences. To think that it could go from that to storing experience is uh, just the, a complete misunderstanding of, of 
what is being suggested. We say, oh, well, then, so what's your explanation for the persistence of memory? Oh, well, we don't actually have one. We're, we're working on that. <laughs> well, uh, I, I think that... Uh, the persistence of memory argues that these, the 90% of the DNA, which is not known to code for any protein or to have any, the so-called silent portions of the genome, which are about 85% of it is silent, somehow information experience is being stored there. I mean, this is the Lamarckian heresy because they said it fed back into the genetic part of the DNA. But there may be in this one molecule both genetic storage and epigenetic storage. Well, then when you look at these drug molecules that we've been talking about, the psychedelics, what you see structurally that they all have in common is they all have very uh, reactive rings, benzene rings, usually built up on a pentaxial group, a five-sided group in the middle. They're extremely reactive molecules. Okay, um, it was discovered in the 1960s that there's a phenomenon that nobody knows why it happens called intercalation. These drug molecules, if we could blow one up to this big, it would be thin. It would be flat. It's what they call planar. And... Uh, lo and behold, when you look at the dimensions of this molecule against the dimensions of the bond site that lies between the nucleotides of DNA, you discover that this drug molecule can just slip right in there like toast into a toaster. And they sit down on this very large molecule, the neural DNA, and they begin to broadcast its electron spin resonance at a higher frequency or at a higher amplitude than is happening in normal metabolism. And that this amplifying of the electron spin resonance of DNA is what we experience subjectively as the onset of a psychedelic experience. <laughs> well, now you see this, this gives cogency to what we're talking about here because it shows that there is a real material mechanism in the core of ourselves which is relating to this molecule and then all this information is flowing out. So we're beginning to create a, a coherent map appealing to the material mind of how these things uh, may work to transduce higher cortical experiences. Obviously, the mind, the mind-brain system can be thought of as a, like an automobile in the sense that there are always fuel efficiency modifications and design modifications that are possible to imagine, which would make the whole system work better. Serotonin is the molecule that is being competed with by these drug molecules. Well, may it not then be that what these drug molecules represent is the same thing that serotonin represents, but in a slightly more efficient packaging, that somehow from the point of view of cellular of metabolic dynamics, the, the drug molecule is more efficient. It obviously is. That's why it has a greater affinity for the bond site than the endogenously produced neurotransmitter. Well, it's as though, uh, and I think Aldous Huxley was the first person to suggest this, that the mundane demands of day-to-day -day life and evolution, the need to be ever on the alert for attack and so forth, it has led us to evolve a neurological style of chemical suppression of consciousness that we have narrowed our awareness down into certain narrow channels along which danger may approach. But conceivably, this style of uh, this flavor of human brain soup could be changed for a different flavor in which we walked around with a much larger awareness 
and much less immediate focus on being prepared to fall into a fighting stance and fend off an immediate uh, attack on ourselves. I think that what I see as characteristic of uh, psychedelic people and psychedelic communities is a kind of tendency to go for the big picture. Psychedelic people always are aware that whatever they're talking about is nested in a still larger set of relationships, nested in a still larger set of relationships. That awareness of the big picture could probably be mapped onto what is ordinarily called an awareness of Tao. It's that you don't get down into the little stuff because you know what the I Ching calls the prepotent systems of relationship in which the event is embedded. And that feeds back into the personality, that knowing of that, as permission to relax. You know, you're neither pushing the river nor pulling the river. It goes in its good time and you always seem to be comfortable and there uh, with it. See, this logos, this vegetable mind that I keep referring back to, it may be nothing more than the voice of our own DNA, but whatever it is, when we do not have it guiding us and cultivated within our personality, then it becomes all up to the ego to figure out. And the ego is a frightened, pathetic, grasping creature and will make a mess of it, you you may be sure. Sure. Yeah. In these uh, in these cultures, in these South American cultures, when are uh, children introduced into the, into the process? Well, this varies. In among the Aguaruna Hivero, a male child gets his first taste of ayahuasca at three days, yeah. uh, but it's just a taste. The mother just wets her nipple, but it's to to introduce him into the and I'm sure the taste I mean the immune system is locking on to all that stuff and scripting it in immediately and for the rest of his life his immune system will be reacting to that it varies from tribe to tribe but it's uh, it's just part of the ambiance it's part of the air they breathe you know the surface of the forest gives way to the invisible forest Behind the visible forest is the invisible forest. I mean, they say this to you. And, uh, it, you know, it's a real question to which I suppose there's no answer. But I would, maybe virtual reality will someday let us know this. I would love to have the hallucinations of a deep forest shaman because it would tell me how much of a how much the content of the hallucination is genetically based and how much is culturally based because for instance like uh, so often on psilocybin the hallucinations are mechanistic highly polished surfaces consoles almost glass crystal instrumentality of some sort well is that me or because then I, I, if I take morning glory seeds, you know, then I get Mayan temples and rainforests. And but the character of these compounds is very interesting because it's it's not slightly one way or another. I mean, when you get into these places, it's like the absolute distillation of it. Uh, my, my question really related to where could you see. Uh, this process being introduced into our culture as far as uh, uh, children you know, several mentioned a couple of the process of deconditioning is, uh, is a big part of this experience and I'm presuming it's cultural deconditioning the, by the technologies we've surrounded ourselves with and so how far down for that conditioning do you see introducing uh, this element well, that's an interesting question. I had, I've thought about the issue of psychedelics and children, but mostly from the point of view of an initiation 
into the full spectrum of possibility that comes at puberty. That's where you are inducted into the sexual universe. You might as well also be given the full set of options. Uh, I don't see. I don't think. I think that if the psychedel, if the society is psychedelic. Uh, you don't need to particularly radically restructure it. It will restructure itself. So what's important for me in these Amazonian societies is that everybody gets together and frequently does it. And the children are there as well. At the Bridge Conference at Stanford two weeks ago, there was a woman's panel about women and psychedelics. But, my God, this is such edge stuff. I mean, psychedelics are edgy enough. And then you add in the issue of giving them to children. Anyone willing to stand up and say they think children should be given psychedelics is in real danger of having their children taken away from them. (laughs) And that's the kind of society we're living in if push came to shove. So uh, it's touchy. Uh, You mentioned a little while ago about... uh uh, timing of taking something like mushrooms is what kind of circumstances or uh, things you weigh out if it's to determine when you would like to go into an experience? The basic rule is I think that I think of it as diving. So the surface of the water should be calm before you undertake diving. And that means you know, just a certain amount of psychic turmoil has to be pushed to the walls. This is maybe hard advice to hear because many people maybe take psychedelics at the height of psychic turmoil as a way of finding their way out of it. I've done that too, but I'm too old for that malarkey now. If I've got psychic turmoil, I'll just sit with it now. <laughs> yeah. Is ayahuasca... Uh, just a better delivery system for DMT than smoking. Is that why it, it's used? It's because when you try to smoke the bean cap, it's harder to tell how much you're getting. No, it's not that it's a well. It is a better delivery. It's slower. Ayahuasca, you can actually make sense of it. Ayahuasca and mushrooms are very interesting in their contrast because they. Uh, The the amazing thing about the mushrooms, the unique thing about them, is that they speak. They speak English. They talk to you. They will answer questions. They will carry on conversations, so forth and so on. No other thing in my experience speaks not like that. I mean, there may be in some, at the height of some crazed trip, some brief, something or other but psilocybin just pulls up a chair on the porch and puts its feet up you know and uh, and ayahuasca does not do that at least in my experience the language of ayahuasca is visual it, it's you, you're, the front of your head becomes like a cinemascopic camera after a good five-hour ayahuasca trip, you just feel like your eyes must be bugging out of your head. I mean, it's like going to Madison Avenue with money. You have done so much looking. Just look, 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 look at this, look at this. I mean, your eyes hurt from so much looking because it speaks to you in this visual language and it barely ever makes a sound and certainly no no linguistic sound. So why these things have this different presentation? And then, of course, the thing about DMT that I should have mentioned that is the most astonishing, appalling, and the, the definitive characteristic is that for a lot of people, myself included, you burst into a place that is absolutely swarming with some kind of intelligent life. I mean, I call them self-transforming elf machines. It's definitely an elf place. And, you know, you thought you were going to get the white light or you thought you were going to get an Huxley-esque aphorism on form and void. And no, you got 16 elves trying to climb inside your clothes in this broom closet in hyperspace that you've broken into. Very odd. And uh, they... they 
my personal model of all this is that it's a series of concentric shells. And I really think that the DMT flash is the deeper level, that all psychedelic experiences lead into this elf-infested, dome-like, backlit space. But most psychedelics don't can't quite carry you there, or they carry you there in such a state of discombobulation that when you come down, you have no memory of that part of the trip. A lot of people, I think, go to that place on DMT and come down with no memory of that part of the trip because you, at that moment when you encounter this tribe of elves, your choices are pretty stark. You have to either immediately jettison everything you've ever believed about reality or you have to immediately embrace the idea that you are now absolutely crackers and uh, for me it was an easy choice to make Uh, (laughs) but it causes anxiety in some people and I I want to learn from these things I mean they are not simply there observing you they're waiting almost holding a net like uh, firefighting personnel at the site of a disaster they're waiting for you to come to and then they start speaking in this language of the visibly beheld logos. This is where it is most concretely beheld, that these elves things, which look like jeweled, self-dribbling basketballs or something, are all around you, and they sing. They make sound in these crystalline, high-pitched, warbling voices, and that condenses into the air as objects and words and other little beings and so they're these things they offer you these objects a single one of them if it could be brought into this room and set here would change the course of the world forever it's like the sort of thing that they keep in the nurseries of flying saucers you know Uh, and and they're offering these things to you at a ripping pace I mean they just say look at this you say oh my god it's say no forget that look at this oh my god and and these things are like Fabergé eggs of jewels and ivory and stone but that's not they're not made of jewels and ivory and stone they're made of light and meaning and intentional humor and triple entendre and you know it's a linguistic object material and they're saying do this we do this you can do this make these things and they're and some of these little objects themselves begin to sing and make other objects and this is all what has happened is you have burst into the hall of the mountain king these are the the demon artificers these are the elves making making their transdimensional toys why hell who knows why just to have arrived there is accomplishment enough you can spend a lifetime sorting out why but they they seem to be the vector at the end of time they are an anticipation of who is waiting and if you know the pre-socratic philosopher heraclitus the 52nd fragment of heraclitus says the aeon is a child at play with colored balls this is it, folks. Heraclitus saw the aeon. The aeon is a child at play with colored balls. And it's the puer at the end of time. It's this thing. It's so radiant that you can hardly look at it. I mean, it has intimations of death, eternity, transformation. And yet, it's all going on in this weird dimension of humor. It's like a Bugs Bunny cartoon running at triple speed. And all of this action is taking place. This is a real place. And science denies its existence. I mean, if it weren't for the fact that you pay to hear me, the only category society has for what I have just told you is serious delusion. This this man has a pathologic, a chronic pathological delusion. It appears harmless in the social context because it nowhere comes tangential to functioning in this society. But don't put a lot of pressure on him. Obviously, the guy could snap at any moment. Uh, <clears throat> you 
Yes. Are morning glories just morning glories? Seeds? <laughs> Is this a test? <laughs> Oh, you mean, is that the psychedelic one? Yeah. I see what you're asking. There are many, many, m- there are many, many morning glories, and only a, only a few are psychoactive. But the good news is that one of the few psychoactive ones is this heavenly blue morning glory that's grown as an ornamental. Uh, and that was one of the great sacraments of the Mayan civilization and the Aztecs. And uh, it contains their god alkaloids that will definitely give you a very intense experience. And it's just filled, at least in my experience, with the motifs of those civilizations, uh, Mayan hieroglyphs and that style of that poor kills style of carving. There's also a morning glory called um, Argeria Nervosa, the Hawaiian baby wood rose. It isn't really Hawaiian, it's native of India. But it's a very powerful hallucinogen. And interestingly, it has no history of human usage. No aboriginal group claims it. This is one of the things I'm kind of interested in is why one psychedelic plant will have thousands of years of devoted use and another nobody will have ever had anything to do with. Hawaiian woodrose is really quite a puzzle because per unit grant, per unit volume, It's probably the strongest psychedelic uh, there is. You only have to eat about six seeds of that. And uh, it does have a a cardioactive glycoside that will put your heart through its paces. So be aware of that. I, I took that one one time. And I had this long, extended hallucination based entirely on the theme of sea urchins. I was in this vaulted space that was clearly the interior of a vast sea urchin. And these purple tit-like protuberances were on all the walls and on the floor. And and a coach with six white horses was being hauled through the space. A coach shaped like a a purple sea. It just didn't make any sense at all. Do you um, eat the seeds that come in the package? The, they, you have to be careful with those because they've dipped them in a fungicide to make it impossible for you to get loaded on them. So what you have to do is grow them out. You have to devote yourself. This is a good shamanic homework. A summer of growing... growing. Yeah, I was just about to grow them just because I always love them. I didn't... So oh, grow, grow them. I've, never, you've, I've grown them before, but I've never found a seed from a flower. Did they just... Oh, no, they'll set seed capsules in the autumn, and then what you do is you let them dry out, string runners for them, and let them dry out on their runners, and the seed cap is a little round, swollen thing that has four seeds in it. And then gather all this string and dried morning glory and stuff like that and put it in a big paper bag and close the bag and beat on it, and all the seeds will detach from the thing, and then you can just pour out a bunch of these seeds. It is sickening. It contains ester coumarone, a, a sickening agent. But it's quite spectacular. And if you overdo it, you know, it, it's a big one. It's a big one. There's no question about it. Many of these things are sealed away from uh, abuse, I guess you'd say, by the fact that they're somewhat of an ordeal to take. You know? I mean, they are... They're sickening, or in the onset, there's vertigo, or, you know, uh, but this is all right. This keeps them sealed away, yeah. Either from smoking DMT or drinking ayahuasca, is there much of a, a toxic feeling in your body so when you, after it's over? Or? No, see, the th- interesting thing about DMT and ayahuasca is that they're composed entirely of neurotransmitters. The thing that's amazing about DMT is you smoke it. It comes on in the one minute. It lasts two minutes. It's without a doubt orders of magnitude stronger than any trip you've ever had. You, it lasts two minutes. You come down over the next five minutes, and 20 minutes after that, you can't. There is no trace of it. Not only in your body, but almost as miraculous. There's very little trace of it in your mind. 
it's almost like it happens so fast that short-term memory can't grok it. So people come down raving, and then five minutes later, they don't know what they were raving about. And finally, they're just re- they have to rest with, it was the damnedest thing that ever happened to me, and <laughs> don't ask me any more about it, because I can't, I, I don't know. It was very impressive while it was happening. Then if you do it over years, occasionally, if you can keep your courage up, because I find it takes a lot of courage to do it. Maybe this is because I have a surrender problem. But the very thought of doing it brings sweat to my palms. I mean, it's just so unambiguously profound. But you can, by doing it repeatedly, slowly, slowly build up an image of what's happening in there. And then this little story I told you about the self-transforming elf machines, that's my composite image of what's happening inside the DMT flash. The, The surprise is that there's somebody in there and that they are really interested in you. And the whole thing then begins to take on dimensions that the mere search for psychic health may not have envisioned. Even in their nomination of ayahuasca, you don't feel the... uh... No, ayahuasca, I think you can fairly say that in most cases, people feel better the day after than they did before they did it. It's the only one I know like that where there seems to be a net energy gain that is never lost or if it's lost it's over a long long period of time but no you don't feel thrashed after ayahuasca yeah well, what's the deal then if you can't remember where you were I mean, what, what does transform you you come down you, you may not be able to say where you were but you come down absolutely convinced that you've passed through some kind of cleansing fire there's no doubt that the dross of some aspect of you has been burned away. And it isn't, you see, you come down in a series of declensions. Twenty minutes after it, you may not be able to say very much, but five minutes after it, you'll be thrashing pretty hard to try and say something. It's just that it becomes more and more absurd, almost literally before your eyes. It goes from the sublime to the ridiculous. I mean, you go from having the message, which if you could but deliver it, would lead all mankind to glory, to forget it. (laughs) Over here. The the primitive cultures in the Amazon you were with, um, did they ever take ayahuasca as a group? And you mentioned before that a person, when they do it solely, has a song. Did they ever do it in a group where a group had a song? And I'm wondering what that might be. Yes, they did. There were uh, there were songs that are culturally sanctioned ikaros as well that everybody knows, and then people develop their own ikaros off of that. So yeah, the people we were with, uh, we would get together in groups of about thirty, and I would say ten. Uh, ha- a third of the people would be there with a physical complaint of some sort, in other words, to be cured. A third would be there to learn, meaning to trip for tripping's sake. And a third would be there because it was the most interesting thing going on in the neighborhood, and they would just hang out. Would that be quite, a, quite an experience of kind of like a undeniable unity you all would uh, experience at that time? We took it pretty much for granted, but considering how much trepidation I would have if I were to take ayahuasca with 30 of you chosen at random, I, we thought nothing of it, you know, and uh, we were a pretty tight group. The shaman insisted that Kat and I move in with the village, that we were not to come and go from the little town nearby. And so we were part of things 24 hours a day for five weeks. And uh, I love ayahuasca people. I think uh, ayahuascaros are unique people. They have a quality. You can hear it in their voice, actually, that they have attained some kind of authentic status of being that the rest of us are, are striving toward. Yeah, yeah. I'm just wondering about uh, if you identify a difference between curing and healing. Um, the people who were coming for cure were coming for physical cure, presumably. And healing 
you may have even while you're physically dying. Uh, True. I'm well, just trying to sort of see what you meant by cure. Well, these categories are not so rigid in the Amazon. For instance, uh, a lot of what they <laughs> think of as physical problems we would think of as psychological problems. For instance, a, a big problem that a lot of Peruvians have is a disease called susto. But only Peruvians get susto. And what it is, is it's basically bad luck. <laughs> you know, it's when things go wrong and, and won't go right. And then you, and it's, and people will say, oh, you have susto. You better do something about this. And so there's a lot of curing of that kind of a condition. And then there's a lot of, like, what I would call fairly insightful minor psychotherapeutic intervention. I mean, I remember one woman, a fascinating woman. This woman was beautiful, and she was from way in the woods, and, and she had this amazing voice. And uh, she, her complaint was an ulcer. And, and she told the story of this ulcer in the in the meeting, in this amazing liquid voice in the darkness. And uh, after she was finished, Don Fidel just sat. And then he said, um, you're having an affair, and you're concerned what will happen when your husband finds out about this. And this is the cause of this pain in your stomach. And she agreed instantly that this was the cause of the pain in her stomach and that she had known it. And, well, now, I, I don't claim that as an instance of telepathy. I don't think that's what it was. I think it was a very skilled practitioner with a sense of this woman's sexual intensity, the nature of the society. That he just put it together and figured it out, you know, in a stroke of, of brilliance. But then she abreacted and uh, and went uh, the next several days later she was obviously in much better shape it's you know behind uh, disease lies language if you have a material um, if you have a material model of disease then language will not appear to be part of the issue to you but spending time with these people in the amazon everything is about language in a society where magic rules because magic is the, is the uh, domain of human concern in which language is empowered, in which will becomes a force that can strike you dead, you know. So in, in these societies where magic is happening, language becomes everything. And you can cure somebody by simply telling them that you're going to and then acting as though you had. And the, the fabric is, is, will admit of that sort of thing. Can you elaborate on the idea of a song or singing? Well, if you listen to the styles of ayahuasca singing, it can range over a pretty broad range. It can range from something which sounds pretty much like a takeoff of the Gyaltso monks, you know, that very deep diaphragmatic vibration to a fairly lyrical uh, thing. All, not quite, you can't quite dance to it. But I think it's basically that the, you surrender and then the song comes through and the quality of the song uh, resides in the moment. What's always puzzled me is how these people retain these songs. Because once one comes through, they never seem to be lost. Uh, there may be meter in, in the song that I'm not aware of that makes it mnemonically easy to keep track of. But I've heard um, incredible singing. Uh, and, sometime, and sometimes the singing is acknowledged to be incredible. I was in an ayahuasca circle once and songs were sung, and, and this guy was there who nobody really knew, and he sang a song so amazing that the curing stopped, everything stopped, and the shaman just sat down across from this guy and said, T 
teach me this song. We're not leaving till I learn this song. And they sat there till 6.30 in the morning, and he did learn the song. And it was incredible. I mean, even down, it seemed psychedelic. It seemed impossible. The liquid gliding, the strange language with these glottal stops, and then these liquid glissandos. It was impossible to imitate. That's why it took even the shaman hours to uh, commit it. The ayahuasca mm. the composition. It depends on the area of the Amazon, but it is usually either Socotria viridis, which is a small bush in the Rubiaceae related to coffee, or <clears throat> it's a near relative of Banisteriopsis copy in the uh, in the nearby genus Diploteris, Diploteris cabrarana. For some reason, all the genes that produce harmine in the other Banisteriopsis lianas produce DMT in that one. So uh, it's the interplay between these two that controls uh, the the visions. Other questions? Yeah. You mentioned the Buddha a couple times this morning. I was wondering if um, you thought of the effects of that and if you had any about administration or... Well, remember, I said this morning my interests are pretty tightly focused on this tryptamine thing. Uh, There are many, many altered states that are possible, and the detura is one of them that's plant-based, that's been traditionally utilized for magical purposes, but that doesn't seem to me very psychedelic. I also think you have to have a certain kind of personality to handle it. My experiments with it were not very happy, and the people around me who were experimenting with it were really getting out there. When I finally decided to put it behind me was when I, all this was going on in Nepal many years ago, and one day I was down in the market buying potatoes, and I met a friend of mine who also lived in the village and he had been experimenting with Datura for many days. And in the course of our conversation, it came out that he thought we were in his apartment. And then I knew that, you know, he had had a serious breach with reality. I took Datura metal, Himalayan Datura seeds, in the my upper rooms at Bodhanath in, in the Kathmandu Valley. And... I found it very um, hard to uh, engage with in the way I like to engage with these things. You would sit there and nothing seemed to be happening, nothing seemed to be happening, and then your mind would drift off into a kind of twilight. And then there were these strange wraith-like beings, almost like cartoon ghosts is what they were like. And they were coming in through my window, each one bearing an open sheet of newsprint. And these ghostly pages of newsprint would settle in my lap. And I would be sort of bent forward like this. And I would begin reading these stories in this ectoplasmic media. And uh, and then I would snap out of it and say, you know, what was that? Nothing's happening not working nothing's happening and it was very elusive and mercurial and then later there were very complicated muscle contortions and I would find myself with my leg thrown up over my neck and this sort of thing and I would very carefully untangle myself and lay back down and then it would happen again and and I was thinking you know I'm glad this is happening to me and I'm glad nobody is here because I'm sure this must look pretty alarming and it probably is uh, it's a strange ghostly thing uh, where minds and realities seem to get all mixed up I, I remember I had a New Zealander living down the hall from me in this Nepali rooming house. And at one point, I had to go from my room to, through his room to get to the john and in the middle of the night. And I glanced at his bed as I went through, and uh, he was very clearly in the act of making love with uh, a woman, a woman that I vaguely knew just from seeing in the marketplace. 
And the next morning, I mentioned it to him, and he said, yes, uh, he thought she was there too, but she wasn't there, not for him and not for me. So, you know, it was like it was inside somebody else's hallucination. Epistemic murk is a good phrase for those kinds of states of mind, and, and I don't like them because I can't sort it out. You know, I don't like these watery, entangling... Exposure to DMT came full circle again. Well, not quite full circle. Well, see, it wasn't my Catholicism that it took from me. I'd abandoned my Catholicism over five or six years, jettisoning each piece slowly, and managed to transform myself into uh, Jean Genet worshipping... <laughs> existential, dark, anarcho-type character. An atheist, yes. And that's what it took from me in the 15-second interval. That's what I mean. Yeah. I came back to deity, deity, but I I don't think I came back to the Trinity. Uh, The Trinity and all other hypostatizations of deity that we inherit in major religions are such friendly, cheerful, cartoonish stuff compared to, you know, the abyss of DMT. I'm not sure. I didn't exactly come back to deity. I came back to mystery. I immediately understood the relativity of the program of science, which had been my hope, you know. It's not a somebody out there, necessarily. It's more of a something... What? You can't tell because we we cast such a large shadow on what we're looking at. In other words, um, if if information begins to unfold in your head suddenly, s- new stuff that you've never thought so quickly that you have to go, uh huh, uh huh, uh huh. If I were to ask you then. What's happening? You would have to say, I'm having a conversation. That's because the only thing you know to call a situation where you're being given new information that fast is a conversation. But maybe this isn't a conversation. Maybe this is accelerated learning that appears to be happening so fast that it's like a conversation. I tend to... uh, I also notice in myself a weird thing, which is the longer it's been since I've taken something, the more conservative my position will be. I mean, if you catch me nine hours after I've been there, I will take the positions that I've mostly abandoned, the most radical and crazed positions, the extraterrestrial intervention position, all of that. I keep trying to humanize it and to shrink its dimensions But the fact of the matter is, up against it, it's weirder than I say it is. So, um, you know, I don't don't know exactly what to do with that. The mind cannot encompass this thing, I'm convinced. It's like you pour the water of description over it and it beads up and runs off. And so sometimes we're emphasizing one part, sometimes another. It seems to me it's just the limit case of understanding and that maybe that's what it exists for, to demonstrate to human beings that there is a limit case for understanding. For me as a language person and an analytical rationalist and so forth and so on, it's just such an amazing experience to stand in the presence of the unspeakable and to say to see it and to say, you know, you are unspeakable. You are not the white light. You're not the unitary anything. You are the unspeakable. And I can only encounter you in silence. But in silence, I encounter you 100%. And uh, I just didn't think this kind of stuff was psychically lawful. You know, I mean, I guess it isn't psychically lawful. That's the crux of the matter, isn't it? Well, you create metaphors, you tell yourself little stories, you create a new paradigm, 
is what it is. You replace scientific rationalism with psychedelic Zen synchronicity or some other way of describing it. But there is a way to make to make bridges out of it, remembering the relativity of everything. You know, I mean, it really seems to be a relativistic kind of perception. The mystery, which isn't necessarily good or bad, or benevolent or evil, but it's. It has a lot to do with the angle of regarding of what is shown to you. Uh, a lot of people who take mushrooms report some version of, a, of an end-of-the-world revelation. Either we're all going to be lifted off in ships the size of Manitoba or the Maitreya is just around the corner, but this unraveling apocalyptic scenario and then... Uh, the clinical view of that is that it's paranoia. Um, but really, it's the archetype of our civilization. We have built into our civilization this dream of the end. And every war that comes along is hailed as the war of Armageddon. Every tin horn dictator is hailed as the Antichrist. This has been going on for 500 years. Uh, if it's more specific than that, where you actually begin to pull apart, if it's really personalistically paranoid, then you're in my league, and I don't think there's any hope for you. I mean, you just have to uh, really learn. I mean, the way I've fought it is by disbelieving anything, you know, because my life is fairly science fiction-y and carries over it this question which I grapple with all the time which is who do you work for what is going on here do you understand what you're doing and if you don't who does and why did they set you marching because I can tell what's happening here we're trying to tinker with something it's a groping in the dark for a button we're trying to make something happened by saying words, by setting examples, by empowering people to do certain things. This is the mushrooms program, not mine. I mean, left to myself, I would probably be a hermit. And I'm much too cynical for crusades. But the mushroom isn't. The mushroom is a gung-ho kind of guy and uh, you know, has this whole vision of man and fungus hand in hand to the stars. And I just say, you know, you just meet the damnedest people out in the fields, you know, and, and, and this is one of them.